And we must now move on to questions to the Minister of the Environment. And I call Mr. Stephen Moutry. Mr. Moutry. Effective enforcement is an, int an integral part of the planning process, and all alleged breaches of planning control are investigated. My department has a general discretion to take enforcement action when it regards it as expedient to do so. In determining the most appropriate course of action in response to alleged breaches of planning control, my department will take into account the extent of the breach and its potential impact on the environment. Planning enforcement can be a lengthy, protracted and complex process, with many issues and circumstances that may need to be considered. The Department's aim is to rectify the breach, and in many cases the breach is addressed without the need for formal enforcement action. For example, the applicant may submit a retrospective planning application to regularise the situation. In other cases, formal action is necessary, however. This may be held in abeyance until an application is determined or an enforcement notice is appealed, which can add many months on to the time taken to resolve a case. Other departments and agencies can also have a bearing on the effective enforcement of planning control. Given these various factors, it is therefore not possible to advise of a definitive timescale for dealing with enforcement investigations and any associated action taken. However, my department has a business plan target to process to a conclusion 70 per cent of cases within 39 weeks. The most recently published annual stats confirmed that in 2013-14, 66 per cent of enforcement cases were brought to a conclusion within this time period. Thank you, Mr. Motri, for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. But can I ask him what assurances can the Minister give the House today in relation to businesses that open up, some of them in my own constituency, who never apply for planning condi conditions for planning permission and are allowed to trade sometimes years before any enforcement action is ever taken? And I thank Mr. Mitri for the question. And supplementary question. As outlined in my uh, initial answer, the Department take any alleged breach of planning control very seriously. And of course, operating or establishing a business without planning permission or even a planning application is such a breach and is therefore one that is taken seriously. Unfortunately, Due to the complexity of some of these cases and due to the fact that there are many out there who are willing, ready and able to exploit that complexity for their own means and to their own ends, means that these can take a long time to pursue and to bring to a satisfactory conclusion. I am aware of some of the cases uh, within Mr Mutri's own constituency to which he no doubt refers. Currently, there are over 2,800 planning enforcement cases, however, so I would be loath to go into the details of any specific application here on the Chamber floor. However, as I have said, in an ideal world, people would apply for and comply with planning control. And therefore, it is something that I take very seriously, the Department take very seriously. And in advance of the transfer of the planning function to Council in particular, I am determined to make huge inroads into that frightening figure of 2,800 cases. Thank you. And I call Ms. Anna Lowe. Uh, um, the delay in, in processing those cases sometimes is really due to the lack of of staff, the, the manpower in the department. Is the minister confident that he has enough enforcement officers, particularly with the forthcoming handover of planning uh, powers to local councils? I thank uh, Ms Lowe for her question. I am certainly confident in the capacity of the officers I have. However, like any Minister, I would certainly welcome more resources 
be that financial and then human resources to deal with not just enforcement but a whole range of issues that fall under the responsibility of my department. I alluded to Mr. Mutri the, the I suppose, emphasis that I am putting on clearing the backlog of enforcement cases in advance of the transfer of the, the function to Council. But at the point of transfer, councils will be responsible for investigating alleged breaches of plan and control. The councils will also determine what action, if any, will be taken. The department will, however, retain reserve powers for exceptional circumstances to take enforcement action. It's very alarming, and again I referred to this in my initial answer, uh, Ms Lowe, that there are so many people out there who tend to flout planning regulations and have a nice or a know-how about how to subsequently play and frustrate the system. It's my aim to strengthen the system so it is not as exploitable as it currently is. I ask uh, members just to speak up for, for the benefit of those, particularly around the, uh, the back of the room. And I call Mr. Cahill Boylan. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. But following on from the Minister's answers, could the Minister give an assurance that the model he has to deal with enforcement is fit for purpose transferring to local authority? And would he consider an extra role for a building control officer in, in local authority to assist in enforcement of cases? I thank Mr Boylan for that question. I have stated I am certainly content that my staff are capable. I would very much welcome additional resources, not just enforcement, but right across planning and other departmental functions. Once Council assume the function of planning and once they take responsibility therefore for enforcement, it will be very much a matter for them to deal with. The, the budget currently associated with that function will be transferring in full to councils, as will the staff who currently carry out that function. However, should council or a council determine that they need or would like additional resources working enforcement, I mean, for example, if there are a plethora or a multitude of cases, live cases, in any one council area that they think requires extra attention, then they, by all means, can proceed to deal with that as they may and allocate resources accordingly. Okay, I call Mr. Stephen Agnew. Minister, has the present set by the use of retrospective planning permission um, almost sent a signal to developers that act first and get permission later? And if so, uh, what is going to be done to correct that? Uh, and I thank uh, Mr Agnew for his question. However, like yourself, Mr Deputy Speaker, I had difficulty hearing the very start of it. I think I have got the, the gist of it, and it is that of, I suppose, there seems to be an attitude out there that it is easier to beg for forgiveness than ask for permission. And I know Mr Agnew has a particular interest in minerals applications uh, for retrospective approval. I think the point that he is making is certainly a very important one. It is certainly one that I agree with him on. People need to get things right. People need to do things in the right order. If someone wants to build something, if someone wants to carry out a business somewhere, they must apply for planning permission if it is necessary. And I think we, that should be reflected in the seriousness and severity with which the, their particular enforcement cases are dealt with. Thank you. And I call Mr Ian McRae. Two. My department has not given the new councils any branding guidance or advice. There is no legislative requirement for it to do so, nor do I believe that it would be appropriate. The new councils each require a strong corporate brand to enable their stakeholders to identify with them. This makes it very much a local matter that councils are best placed to undertake themselves. My department does, however, 
have powers to change the name of a council. Section 1 of the Local Government Act 2014 provides that the name of each council is the name of the local government district followed by the words district council. Section 1 also allows the Department to make regulations to provide for the name of a council to be other than that provided for by Section 1 of the 2014 Act. I would stress, however, that regulations of this nature would only be made at the request of a council and would permit the council to decide the name which does not end in the words district council. Section 51 of the Local Government Act 1972 provides that the Department may, by order made on the application of a council, change the name of a district council. Or sorry, change the name of the district of a council. If a name change order is made under the powers conferred by this provision, the final two words of the council's name must remain district council. Regardless of which power is used to change the name of a council, Section 2 of the Local Government Act 1972 provides for a council to be known as a borough council if it is in possession of a borough charter, or a city council if there is a city within the local government district. That clarify. <laughs> <laughs> a supplementary, if you dare. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I think that's as clear as mud. But um, no, no, nonetheless, I uh, thank the Minister for, for his answer. The Minister will be aware, and I suppose it is in the branding aspect of things, that, that some councils um, attempt to use um, languages as an opportunity to get one up on the one side of the community, the other words with using Irish language or indeed um, Ulster Scots. But can the Minister ensure that? his department does keep a close eye on those councils who are introducing um, other languages as well as um, English to ensure that the minority community um, isn't um, treated in unequally. Uh, I thank the, the member for that supplementary question and can see where he is coming from with the need to or the importance of the need to safeguard the, the, the rights and wishes of a minority community, whatever that community may be, in the new council areas. To uh, that, that effect, I can assure the member that Section 41 of the Local Government Act 2014 provides the call-in mechanism, I suppose, that 15 per cent of the members of the council may present a request for the reconsideration of a decision to the clerk of the council on either or both of the following grounds that the decision itself was not arrived at after a proper consideration of the relevant facts and issues, and that the decision would disproportionately sorry, affect adversely any section of the inhabitants of the district. This provision will apply to the majority of council decisions, including any on branding. Mr. Ian Mullen. What the minister said is regards in regard Brandon, but uh, I would ask the minister if he would uh, look again at this uh, from a point of view that uh, this is consistent with the European Charter for Protection and Promotion of Languages. You no, know, in the Brandon, Gormel Magut. Gormel Magut, the few yes, can call you August. Gormel Magut, for Honya and Kesh, I thank the member for that question. Well, it is vitally important, and in my opinion, it is a fact that rights are afforded to all inhabitants of a community or of a new council district, be they a minority or a majority. That goes as far as the protection of the rights of Indigenous language speakers. It's in the council's interest, I believe that they brand themselves in a way that best reflects the makeup of that council area. They want as many people, in fact, they should want everyone within that council area to identify with them as the corporate brand for that area. Therefore, in my opinion, it would be remiss of a council to proceed and ignore the wishes of any section of the community. I call Mr. Robin Swan. Um, can I ask the Minister, following the Ulster Unionist addition to Clause 125 
of the Local Government Act. When will his department be bringing forward regulations on domain names? And will these regulations also ensure that some councillors do not dedicate excessive times within councils in such petty battles? Thank the member for the question. And the parish the thought that any time within our councils would be wasted on petty battles. I think that should remain our, our domain. <laughs> uh, work is ongoing on the domain names uh, subsequent to the successful amendment tabled by the Ulster Unionists during the, the local government reform debate. Uh, my officials are working extensively on this and a range of other issues. And they're doing, not doing so in isolation, but doing so in partnership with local government. Thank you. And Mr. Fran McCann is not in this place. So I call Ms. Michaela Boyle. From the 1st of April 2015, councils will have a statutory requirement to prepare local development plans for their respective districts. A council plan will be made up of two documents, a plan strategy which is adopted first and which will set out the council's objectives and strategic policies for the development of its district and a subsequent local policies plan which will set out the council's local and site-specific policies and zonings. In preparing their development plans, councils must take account of central government policies such as the regional development strategy and the strategic planning policy statement and indeed they must also take account of relevant European directives, and all of this will be tested at the independent examination into the plan. However, one of the fundamental reasons for giving these powers to councils is to allow them to bring forward plans that interpret central government policies and strategies in a way that is appropriate for the unique aspects of each council area. This is important because each of our new councils face different social, environmental and economic issues and each have different topographies, populations and settlement patterns to consider. I firmly believe that local councils will be best placed to take forward this work to shape their local areas for the future. The power to prepare local development plans will operate in conjunction with the new council powers of community planning and regeneration and also with existing council functions. Together, these powers provide district councils with a new and potent opportunity to develop agreed future visions for their areas and to prepare a coordinated and planned approach to delivering this vision. Hey, Ms. Michaela Boyle for supplement. Uh, uh, can I thank the Minister for his uh, response? And Minister, as part of the new area plans, will rural councils have the powers and opportunity uh, to address the housing needs of non-farming rural dwellers? Uh, I thank Ms Boyle for that supplementary question. In drawing up the area plans, as I have said in my original answer, there are two things that must be considered by the, the new council, working in conjunction with planners, those being regional planning policy and the regional development strategy. However, it is my belief, and I have outlined that already today, that the reform of local government is not just it wasn't just about doing things cheaper, it's about doing things better. It's about empowering local councils to make decisions for and that will impact on their areas. If, for example, in a rural council area there is a huge demand for rural housing that councillors may feel isn't adequately served by existing planning policy, then they can, by all means, work with planners and within the confines of existing policy to find something that suits them better. I'm going to call Mr. Patsy McGlone. And just to clarify, presumably area plans are still confined to the lakes of towns and villages and the constraints within which that, that places on it uh, in the context of policy. Uh, but could I ask the, <coughs> the Minister uh, what checks and balances 
are going to be in place to ensure that, in everyone's interests, the key cornerstone pillars of fairness and equity and equality are there for, for everyone in local societies. Uh, the new local development plan system provides a range of measures to ensure that local development plans are fair and meet the needs of the local community. The Council's local development plans will be subject to the Section 75 obligations and the Council must comply with the statutory requirement to have due regard to the need to promote equality of opportunity. The local development plan will therefore be subjected to an equality impact assessment by Council. As I said out previously, in preparing their local development plans, Councils must take account of central government policies such as the Regional Development Strategy and the Strategic Planning Policy Statement. The SPPS highlights the Executive's Together Building a United Community strategy, which is committed to addressing all barriers that prevent or interfere with the creation and maintenance of shared space and ensuring that all individuals can live, learn, work and play wherever they choose. The SPPS also emphasises that Council should utilise development planning, regeneration and development management powers to contribute to the creation of an environment that is accessible to all communities, socially and religiously mixed, has a high standard of connectivity and supports shared use of the public realm. The Local Development Plan will also be prepared in accordance with the Council's Statement of Community Involvement which is designed to ensure that anyone with an interest in the Council's plan is given ample opportunity to become involved in its preparation from the very earliest stage. Call Mr. Jonathan Craig. Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, question number five. From the 1st of April 2015, Councils will be the planning authorities responsible for determining the vast majority of planning applications within their district. As Sprucefield is within the new Lisbon City and Castlereagh District Council, any applications in that location will be submitted to the new council unless it is classed as a regionally significant application, in which case it will be submitted directly to the department. Regionally significant developments will form the top tier of development proposals which will have a critical contribution to make to the economic and social success of Northern Ireland as a whole or a substantial part of the region. They are likely to be small in number and will raise strategic considerations with impacts or benefits that extend well beyond the area of an individual district council. Retail development even large-scale retail proposals will not generally have a regional impact beyond individual council areas. Therefore, such proposals should properly be dealt with at council level, and indeed that is the approach that I recently consulted upon for the subordinate legislation that will give effect to the transfer of planning to councils. However, it is important to remember that the minister, whoever it may be, will still retain a call, in, a call in power if any applications were to raise issues of regional significance. Mr. Jonathan Craig for a sub Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. And I, I note with interest that the, mm -hmm. the Minister has definitely been having lessons on how to give a political answer there mm -hmm. on what is or is not of regional significance. Um, Obviously, with the, the John Lewis application and the restrictions put on it, I would like a straight answer. Is that going to be the responsibility of the new council, or will that be pulled back in, either by the minister, or will it be held as part of a regional decision-making policy by the department? Uh, I thank Mr Craig for the second question, to which he would like a straight answer, so I can give an extremely straight answer. He wants a, an answer about the John Lewis application. There is no application from John Lewis. There has been no application from John Lewis. My department is unaware of any application pending from John Lewis. 
Call Mr. Phil Flanagan. With the free last control, you cash Deborah Shea. Question number six. I have given very careful consideration to Tamborne's proposal to drill a core of rock from Clegan Quarry near Belcoo and whether this is permitted development under current legislation. I have concluded that this is an EIA development requiring full planning permission and that permitted development rights do not apply. In making this assessment, I have been mindful of my department's responsibility to ensure that the environment is protected at all times and that full consideration is given to any likely significant environmental impacts of such a proposal. I have concerns that this is an existing quarry where unauthorised extraction has taken place. I believe that there is insufficient information to establish what environmental impacts may have already arisen as a result of these unauthorised activities. Therefore, it is not possible to assess the environmental impact of the drilling cumulatively with other unknown environmental impacts of unregulated activity. In arriving at this decision, I believe I must proceed on the basis of a precautionary principle. This principle establishes that a risk exists if it cannot be excluded on the basis of objective information and, in the case of doubt as to the absence of significant effects, then a full environmental assessment should be carried out. I have therefore concluded that this is EIA development requiring full planning permission with an accompanying environmental statement and current permitted development rights do not apply. Okay, and Mr. Flanagan for Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And like I've said before, I welcome the Minister's decision um, during the summer. Um, can I ask the Minister what, intent, what action um, his department intends to take um, to explore um, and deal with previous unauthorised development at this site, which is causing uh, concern in the local area? Thank you for that other question, or thank Mr. Flanagan for that other question. As I outlined in my answer to a supplementary question from Mr. Agnew earlier, I believe that the issue of unauthorised work, not just at this quarry, but at any quarry or indeed any location across the north, is one that should be taken very seriously. Therefore, uh, I currently have officials looking at the prospect of an enforcement case on this site. I believe it is vitally important that we understood what went on if we are to be in any way assured that what is proposed to go on site is safe. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sammy Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Perhaps the Minister would outline for us how exactly he believes that the drilling on a site where there has been, as he describes, unauthorised extraction, i.e. the removal of rock, how that is likely to lead to problems when a firm drills down through the remainder of the rock. And would he not accept from me that his decision was not based on any planning reason at all? In Rallou, in East Antrim, in Lorne Lock in East Antrim, at Inver in East Antrim, similar drilling was allowed without planning permission having been granted. It was regarded as permitted development. Is this not an example of his prejudice rather than a professional planning decision and one which should be and could be and I hopefully will be resolved in court? I'm not sure which uh, question Mr. Wilson wants me to answer. A few, yes, Kion Kolya, but I, I have a feeling I might have to use some of that practice on giving political answers at this juncture. The decision I made was one that I have the authority to make as Environment Minister. I'm responsible not just for planning, but also for ensuring the protection of our environment. Each application is judged on its own merit, and each application is assessed in its own right. I have at no stage displayed any prejudice whatsoever, despite, despite 
the member's best attempts to get me to do so. And uh, I'm afraid that that ends the other uh, period for oral questions. So we now move on to topical questions, and I call Ms. Maeve McLaughlin. Um, can I ask the Minister to address the, the local concerns that the government departments uh, will provide the necessary resources in terms of the transfer of new functions to the local councils? Uh, I've got a few questions for you, and I thank uh, Ms McLaughlin for that question. She's certainly correct in identifying that there are local concerns around the budget that will be transferring to local government in association with the functions that are transferring to local government. However, she would be wrong if she were to think that those concerns are only local. I have outlined on this uh, floor and in other fora my concern that uh, some of the departments will, primarily DSD, have indicated that the transfer of community development will be accompanied by a 4 per cent cut in that budget. I have outlined time and time again, and it is one that has been supported by parties in the Executive and in the Assembly, that functions that are transferring should transfer at a point that is rates neutral. The reform of local government should not cost more money to local government. It is something we should be trying to sell to councils and to uh, citizens across the north. And I don't think it will go down too well if they see that we are just trying to pass our cuts onto them rather than pass our powers onto them. Uh, on this particular issue, I have written to uh, the Minister for Finance and Personnel, as well as the Minister for Social Development, outlining my concerns. I have raised this issue on more than one occasion in the executive. Also, given that the executive signed up to this, I think it's, it's vitally important that we remain united on it. And if local government reform is to work as well as I'm sure we all want it to work, we need to ensure that any transfer of functions is rates neutral at the point of transfer. Thomas McLaughlin for supplement. I thank the minister for that response, uh, and specifically. Um, quite rightly point out that these aren't just local concerns, they're, they're, they're right across sectors. But can I ask specifically then, in terms of the timetable of the transfer of functions, is there update uh, in terms of progress around that timeline or timetable? Graham uh, I thank the, the member for that uh, supplementary question. By and large, things are going according to plan. I have to touch wood whenever I say that. However, there is one issue for concern that has been flagged up both by local government and indeed to local government and more recently to executive members. That uh, refers specifically to the, I suppose, inability thus far to have the DSD Urban Regeneration and Housing Bill brought to the floor of this assembly. I know that the ESD minister is extremely keen to see it here, and he has written to executive colleagues last week outlining the importance of it. This function is integral to the success of the reform of local government, and community planning, which is something I've heard most members in this House talk about and seen how great it has the potential to be, but without this power, which will be vested upon it by the passage of this bill in the Assembly, it would be very much a toothless tiger. So it's vitally important that this gets to the Assembly and gets through the Assembly. And I call Ms. Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And uh, I'm sorry, Minister, but I'm going to go along the same vein as what most of question time has been about today, and that's to do with the transfer of uh, planning powers to the local council. And can I ask the Minister for his assessment of any possible any potential efficiencies? presented uh, by transferring through the local government the planning powers. I uh, thank uh, Ms Bradley for her question. As I, I said that, it, that planning belongs in local government and therefore I think it's right and I know everyone within this chamber 
look forward to the transfer of planning there with some concerns, and those concerns are ones shared by those in local government too, particularly around capacity. And I'm glad to say that there's an ongoing capacity building programme which has been well participated in by councillors right across the, the new council areas. I think it's vitally important that we build not just the competence of councillors and indeed staff and councils and staff transferring to councils, but we also build the confidence of councillors to deal with these complex, often complex and almost always controversial planning decisions. As regards making efficiencies, I certainly hope that transferring planning to local government will allow decisions to be made more efficiently. However, I certainly do not see this as an opportunity for me to make cost efficiencies and save money to the department. I spoke earlier of, of the, the cut being uh, transferred by another department, but I can give the House an assurance that I will be transferring the full budget associated with the planning function to local council. Also, it is worth saying that planning generates income, and while the past few years have seen well, we're starting to see now again an increase in the number of applications. It's thought that with an upturn in the economy, more applications will be coming in and councils will be generating even more revenue associated with planning. Thank you. And Ms. Bradley for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, I, I, I know, and I think a lot of us are interested in this because a lot of us come from local council background, and that's where we all were before we became MLAs. And I know I've been speaking to councillors in my own area who have been doing their training and have found it extremely worthwhile. I just wanted to go on to that and ask the Minister, does he agree that there needs to be a certain level of uniformity across all the councils in order to avoid um, any inconsistencies or opportunities for individuals or developers to take advantage in some council areas? I have a few. Yes, Kuncolia, and I concur entirely with the member. While it is important that the councils have autonomy, it is vitally important that we do have a degree of uniformity, as the member put it. It is important to emphasise that the Department will retain an oversight role, and I would anticipate very much in the formative months and perhaps even years there will be quite a lot of hand-holding done uh, with councils to, to walk them through planning I suppose, and all their functions until they are able to run with it themselves. Thank you. And it comes to Peter Weir. Deputy Principal Speaker, the Minister may be relieved to know I am not asking anything on either planning or uh, local government, though, as he shakes his head, perhaps I am very tempted to do so. I uh, can ask the Minister what plans does the Department have to, have to intervene uh, to prevent uh, further destruction to the environment and the natural habitat of the Second Commons in Donegadee? I thank the Member for not asking me anything else about local government. However, I kind of now wish, wish that he had. He's asked an extremely <laughs> specific question. I outlined earlier, um, obviously, my role as Minister for the Environment and the Department's role as Department of Environment is about protecting the environment. And I can assure the member that should uh, he furnish me with further detail on this particular uh, case in Donahoudi, to which he, he refers, that uh, I will ensure that the Department takes swift and robust action. Thank the, the Minister if you can. for that, that response as far as it went. Uh, obviously, one of the concerns that is quite often raised by residents, not just in this case, but in the wider context of where there is a, uh, action being taken which has potential damage to the environment, has been that, that um, by the time the Department is notified and is in a position to take action, that developers or whoever uh, are then, if you like, feel that they have a degree of window of opportunity to cause whatever destruction they want before there is any intervention. What assurances can the Minister give that they, the NIEA or indeed any other organisation can act fairly much instantaneously to prevent destruction so that uh, those who are looking to, to create that destruction can be stopped uh, without there being any particular delay in the situation? I thank uh, the, the, the Member for his su supplementary question. Not uh, too long ago in this chamber I outlined as part of my 
root and branch review of NIEA four new operating principles for the agency. And one of those, and I believe possibly the most important one of those, was to make the agency more customer focused and customer friendly. And when we talk about customer, I, I'm not sure I even like the word customer, but it's based on a customer service model. We're not talking merely about developers who need NIEA's assistance or uh, consultation responses to get permits, but we're also talking about members of a community, people living out there who feel that their environment is being damaged. They should know that they are able to contact the agency and that the agency will take their uh, report seriously and will act upon it. Mr. Ian Mill. And we're back to local government again. I'm sure you're glad to hear. Uh, could you outline for us the structures that are currently in place, you know, both within local government and central government, to ensure the smooth running or the smooth transformation from 26 to 11? Thank you, Mr. Milne. Thank you, Mr. Milne. Thank you, Mr. Milne. Thank you, Mr. Milne, for the question. I think you're going to have to stop getting Sean McPeak to do these questions for you and <laughs> get someone else instead. Uh, well, currently there are a lot of, of structures and subgroups and that in place. Uh, Mr Boylan, I'm sure will be able to fill you in on the exact names and, and functions of all of them, but there's a lot of work being done on the reform of local government and I'm glad to say all that work is being done in conjunction with local government. I think that's vitally important. It, it can't be seen that we are imposing the reform on councils, they have to see the rationale behind it, the reasons of it, and indeed the advantages of it. And I think most of that work has been done to good effect. Now that we're just what eight months or so away from V Day or, 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 or Vesting Day, there obviously does seem to be a renewed sense of urgency. I believe we can work well with that sense of urgency, but have to work hard to ensure that it doesn't become a sense of panic. Mr. Mullen, for supplement. Thanks, uh, Deputy Speaker, or Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. I just want to uh, follow on to say, do you see a role for the voluntary and uh, community sectors in helping to design uh, and manage these structural changes? <sighs> Well, uh, the voluntary and community sector certainly have an extremely important role to play and will have an extremely important role to play once the new councils are established and up and running. Or sorry, I assume that they will. It will very much be a decision for the new councils, but it would be foolish of them, in my opinion, to uh, disregard the undoubted expertise and experience that do exist in that field, particularly when they are taking on new functions such as community development, such as urban regeneration. That is why I am determined that community planning does fulfil its potential as such a powerful tool to effect real change in the communities in which we live. And if it is to, to do so, it is going to need the I suppose, participation of many sectors, not least the voluntary and community sector. Mr. Jonathan Craig. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. Minister, I'm going to keep on the line of uh, the new councils that are coming in, um, but I'm going to actually concentrate on a local issue. In the Lagat Valley area, there is a backlog of approximately 350 enforcement cases at present. Um, the department is working hard on reducing that number, but being honest about it, it will not be reduced down to an acceptable level prior to the powers being handed over to the new councils. Can the minister give me assurances that appropriate staffing will be transferred to the new councils to continue to deal with this issue? I thank the member for his question, and I'm delighted to be able to give him the assurance that the appropriate staff will be transferred. Whenever uh, we're looking at the transfer of planning staff 
across the council areas, we do look at existing applications in those areas, historic applications in those areas, and the volume, I suppose, of how many cases are live currently or have historically been processed in those areas. The same applies to enforcement. I mean, if, if you saw one council area that deals with 10,000 planning applications and 350 enforcement cases a year, obviously you will allocate more resource to that council area than you will to a council area that deals with 5,000 uh, applications and no enforcement cases because uh, people there play by the rules. And uh, that concludes uh, the time for topical questions.